Yep. Thank you everyone so much for being here once again. Um, this has been a series of webinars that we are hosting uh, related to building science. And this is the third in the series. And today we're going to talk about moisture. Uh, so again, thank you all for being here on time. Thank you for your continued support with these. Uh, we love seeing everyone on uh, online. So thank you uh, again for that. Uh, so before we get started officially, we're going to talk a little bit about housekeeping. Uh, you are in listen-only mode, so if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature on the GoToWebinar platform, and uh, I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Um, uh, actually, there's not a copy of the slides in the handouts. There, was a, <laughs> there, <laughs> so will, be. <laughs> there will be. Uh, Ali will send it out uh, via email when the webinar is complete, and he'll also include a link to a, a recording of this webinar. So if you miss a, a little bit or you want to share it, uh, you'll have that capability uh, as soon as we're done. Um, keep the feedback coming. You guys have been great. We've got a lot of great topic ideas. So if you have any more, again, use that Q&A feature. And keep in mind, this webinar is for a general audience. Um, we uh, we have a lot of people from weatherization, a lot of building builders and contractors, but we also have some homeowners and uh, other people who are not as as uh, technically inclined as some of us. So keep that in mind. We're going to cover a big topic today with a lot of uh, uh, go a lot of different ways. So uh, I'm sure that you'll get something out of it in the end, though. And then uh, the go-to webinar functionality, just real quick, we don't, uh, we're not experts by any means, but this should help you out a little bit. Again, uh, you will not see the handouts. I do apologize for that, but you will see the questions uh, down there, and that's how you uh, get in touch with us. A couple of people have uh, uh, already found it, and thank you very much for letting us know about the music. Uh, so that's how you get to the, uh, uh, to the control panel there and go to uh, webinar. I want to know, is the feedback on the music positive or negative? Because that's me playing uh, we'll, it off We'll, we'll talk about it later, Mike. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, right, yeah, so, and please uh, use the chat feature and, and uh, give, us, give us your comments and thoughts as we go. So, yeah. Real quick, Joey, quick 10-second introduction of you. 10 seconds. Okay. So uh, my name is Joey Starr. I'm a project manager and trainer at South Face. I uh, primarily work with weatherization and really anything to do with building science and uh, testing and uh, building diagnostics. Excellent. Thanks. And I'm uh, Mike Barsick, and I'm a technical principal. And I could do a lot of our live training, which hasn't happened in the last couple months. So um, it's exciting to be able to do these. I love doing training. I love talking about stories and experiences. And uh, I've been um, trying to get out and uh, <clears throat> having issues with my um, uh, my walking around outside with my mask um, fogging up my glasses. So this is the strategy that I came up with. And I kind of like wearing a mask because it's helping me deal with pollen. And I thought it was interesting, Joey, you have a different technique where you just hold your breath the entire time you're outside. Is that is that? Is that how that works? I yep, I just I just don't even read. <laughs> I don't know. Is there? Do you, does anyone sense a theme here? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, thanks thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, and again, uh, we're South Face. We're based in Atlanta, and we're trying to uh, uh, really make this a hopefully a valuable hour of your time. And and uh, I'm excited because once we finish today, we'll have laid down the foundation of understanding the flow of heat, air, and moisture. And uh, and then we can really build with with topics and uh, and go from there. So again, thank you so much. This is um, where we are at, at present. We're on uh, the, the third one here, which is moisture. And um, Joey, we're going to do one about insulation, install, grading, and quality. Uh, and then I'm excited to announce the, or maybe I should let you announce uh, the, the, the next topic, which will be um, the 30th of the month uh, mm -hmm. after the 21st, the 30th, and we're going to do ventilation. And I don't know, are you, are you as excited about that as I am? I am excited. It's like you said, we've been kind of laying the groundwork. Uh, a lot of questions have been asked about ventilation, so I'm, I'm happy that we're finally going to get to focus on that. And you have part one there. What do, you, what do you mean by that? I am committing. I'm going out on a limb. and I'm going to say that we're going to do a part one and a part two and, right. and maybe just do them back to back um, because uh, I really want to have enough time to cover this topic. So I think um, the that we'll, we'll send out, I'm sure, information about that in more detail, but we hope you can join us for those. And of course, don't forget, 
The next one is Tuesday, the 21st on insulation quality. We've, we've been posting the first four. So this is us announcing. And Joey, I think we're gonna eventually get to this is once a week now. And, mm -hmm. and I think our main day will probably be in May. We'll probably do it every day on Thursday. Does that sound right? Yeah. All right. So that's where we are. And always wanna make a plug for some great resources on southface.org, um, particularly just, again, we've done a lot of stuff with Georgia's energy code more recently. There's a lot of other good stuff there too. Um, and Joey, I vote today in the interest of time, we kind of skip this poll, if that's all right. Um, yeah, like, like I said, we have a pretty good idea. Uh, we get a lot of uh, A and D, uh, alpha and delta there. So a lot of weatherization <laughs> okay. and, and contractors. So just so everyone knows uh, who, who, we're all, who we're talking to. Yeah, and and we um, again, please uh, feel free to chat with us if you're not represented on this list, and we understand we probably could have more uh, listings there. Um, I also thought I'd kind of throw a slightly different slide on here about building science, talking about some of the different climate zones over here. And again, we're trying to use the principles of heat, air, and moisture to design um, high-performance buildings to operate buildings in a high-performance manner. So um, this top uh, is, a, is another version um, of sort of climate zones when you ignore, um, I guess you, say, you could kind of say you ignore states, uh, uh, political boundaries. And the, the bottom one was sort of a blending of this with geopolitical issues. And this is probably one that a lot of people have seen and comes from the energy code. And uh, it's all done based on counties, which makes it easier to enforce. So I think this is a good time if you have the poll ready we're going to ask you to give us feedback this time, not on who you are, but which of these climate zones would you say you predominantly live, work in? Um, and so your choices are hot, humid. I think of that as kind of the Gulf Coast um, and uh, a mixed humid, which is uh, much of the southeast otherwise. And then we've also got cold climate. So you're you're predominantly a heating climate. Uh, you're, it's cold much of the season and then hot or mixed, hot, dry, mixed, dry. And then does anybody come in from the marine climate out on the West Coast? And we'll see, uh, how's it looking there, my friend? Yeah, we're about two thirds. I'm gonna go ahead and shut her down. Uh, it's interesting, as you were talking, um, we had a, a lot of people that initially were choosing hot and humid. Uh, and then I think after you explained it, then they moved to a mixed humid. So I think we still have a lot of, of Georgians, um, but I think people are overestimating how, how humid their climate is, which, you know, if you, if you live in Atlanta and, and Georgia, you definitely, uh, you know, you feel that humidity. So it's, it's funny. And then yeah, about, I, uh, 7% cold and then 1-2% uh, on the marine in the hot. Thanks okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, mm -hmm. If you'll give it back to me. Uh, is it back on my screen yet? I'm sorry. Um, no, it's not. Here you go. Okay. So again, I, we probably should have left this up while we went to the poll. But anyway, yeah. it, it's just something to think about. And these are kind of arbitrary. It's not like it doesn't get cold in the desert and it's not like it you know, and so on. It gets humid very much in other places. We acknowledge that, but these are sort of the designated uh, climate zones or at least one way of doing it. Um, and again, as always, from a building science perspective, we're trying to reinforce this house as a system concept and um, push, the, push the, uh, the understanding of it's more than the sum of its parts. It's the thermal envelope. It's today we're gonna talk about this thing, the weather barrier. It's the heating and the cooling and the fresh air and the lighting appliances. And, and of course, plumbing is another uh, moisture issue. And I thought this was really good. Joey added this. Um, it's also, uh, we're not operating in a vacuum here. Um, it's, it's how the site uh, is affected or, and affects the, the neighboring surrounding area. So we'll definitely see that in a little bit more. And then we keep throwing this uh, human factor in. I did attend a, a really good webinar that Eva hosted um, the other day and it had Suzanne Shelton talking about um, what, what people are gonna be looking for in homes and in ho new home design. Um, it was excellent, she's amazing. They're, they're, uh, they're, uh, the Shelton group does really good market research on what people want. And after, after we get through this pandemic, what do people want? They certainly want healthy homes um, and she mentioned Sam Rashkin, um, <clears throat> who a lot of people probably know who Sam is um, from, from EPA Energy Star and the Zero Energy Ready program. 
uh, mentioning that it's important that we say that this home was built, you know, in accordance with sort of construct uh, uh, with healthy uh, practices and with health in mind. It's built to live in healthily, but humans could go in and wreck that completely. You know, you can come in and be dirty. You can come in and be messy. You can come in and do stinky stuff. And uh, again, the, the people living in the house really can have a lot of impact on the actual performance. So I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective. Well, I want to do a really quick recap, Joey. This is the, um, the three things that we've talked about or we're going to talk about. Heat transfer, anything, uh, we, one commonality is everything kind of goes down the hill. So heat, heat goes from hot to, hot to cold. It's always going to go in either radiation, such as the sun to the shingles, or conduction from the shingles through the decking through a solid or um, convective, like when we you know, put a, uh, a soffit vent and a ridge vent and warm air rises up and out. So um, then last week or earlier rather, we talked about air movement and this is where air moves from high pressure to low pressure. And the amount of air that leaks out is equal to the amount of air that leaks in. And in order to have air leakage, we need a pressure difference and we need some sort of a leak path, a hole. And our goal of course is to get rid of the holes. And of course, we acknowledge the three driving forces, which are the wind, the stack effect, warm air rising, and mechanical fans. So that was our first two webinars. Our third webinar, similar kind of high level concepts, moisture wants to move from wet to dry. Um, liquid water, you know, I learned this in engineering school, liquid water goes downhill, but you know, it's also possible for it to go be wicked upwards. Um, and then we also have a water vapor movement by this process called molecular diffusion, where it travels from uh, a location that has a high amount of water molecules to a location that is uh, much lower, we would say high vapor pressure, lower vapor pressure, and it would permeate, permeate through a solid material, little H2Os would permeate through. So that's called diffusion. And then the other way water vapor can travel is um, on an air leakage. Uh, humid air leaks in, humid air leaks out, that carries a whole lot of moisture. So those are kind of the big four right there. Um, and uh, I always found it interesting, <clears throat> if you talk to anybody that's kind of sort of big in this world of building science, um, and uh, many of us have something that was kind of life-changing or some sort of really impactful episode. Uh, and Joey, I thought, I thought you shared this picture of your home. Can you kind of, mm -hmm. you know, tell us your journey with moisture? Yeah. So uh, if you guys can't tell from my accent, I'm a actually am from the southeast, and I, I moved up to, uh, to <laughs> Illinois um, uh, a few years ago. And I basically first time I had encountered a basement, and uh, I th thought that maybe the, you know, could smell some something going on in the basement. We had hoped to just kind of get the carpet up and, and maybe, uh, you know, paint the floor, but ended up uh, being a little bit uh, bigger of a job than we had anticipated because we noticed some um, some potential uh, harmful bacterial growth uh, in the uh, in the basement there. So uh, that's a pretty pretty standard story. I think we'll see some similar pictures of that that we we see uh, quite often. Yeah, and and it was funny because I worked at South Face. Um, and at one point in my life, I, I, I don't, you know, I started working at South Face and I started learning about building science and really applying this. And I'm a very applied person, so it was a, it was a great fit for me. And um, at one point I realized, I'm like, you know, I, I've always had allergies. I'm allergic to mold and other things, but mold was a big one. And I started thinking back and it was like, I started counting and I can count over half a dozen houses that I've lived in. And every single one of them has had or has a vented crawl space. And um, the house I grew up in, all, houses I rented when I was in school, houses that I bought, houses that I rented after, you know, the house I lived in, I live in today when I bought it. Um, and I trace a lot of the indoor air quality problems that affected my own health um, to the crawl space. And um, hopefully that'll be a topic we get to do one on because I love this, this topic of vented crawl spaces and how to fix them. Um, but having done this, my health is definitely better. And so Joey and I were talking and we thought, 
if you listening have a story you you think you could condense down to you know a paragraph or a couple sentences um, and you want to share it with us we might try to read some of those at the end so if you have a story um, particularly around moisture that sort of will probably stick with you for the rest of your life um, feel free to share it with us in the meantime we're going to drive on and we're going to um, talk about again in more detail the four main things about uh, the way moisture can flow. So the, the key here is that two of them are liquid, and that would be bulk moisture and capillarity, which is a fancy word of saying wicking. So bulk moisture is liquid water, it's plumbing, it's drainage, capillarity is wicking. And of course, moisture is always going from wet to dry. And also from the water vapor standpoint, the issue of uh, vapor diffusion on the molecular level passing through a permeable material and also air leakage or infiltration. Um, so we'll drive on and we're going to start, we're going to kind of go in this order. So we're going to talk about some foundation waterproofing issues. We're going to talk about site drainage issues. And then later on at the very end, we're going to kind of do a little case study and talk about something called a drainage plane in more detail. Um, so we'll we'll jump uh, somewhere here into vapor and then come back at the end. So uh, encountering bulk moisture, <clears throat> I like these pictures. They're from assessments that we've been involved in. This one, um, if you kind of look at it, you can see that there's a plumbing leak that's actually causing the foundation wall to be wet. It's probably a small drip or a small spray off of this. Um, usually it's the solder joints and things that leak. Um, and then this photo clearly indicates there have been, um, it's dry now, but there clearly have been some moisture issues. You see um, evidence of wicking and um, mold growth, and you see rust on the bottom of this. And you know, all of that indicates you know, there's a moisture issue in this house. And it probably didn't fix itself. You know, maybe it did, but it probably didn't. So if you encounter this and it's dry, uh, that <laughs> doesn't mean the house is good. Um, so let's take a little section of foundation waterproofing. And boy, if there was ever a time when a belt and suspenders approach is, is not a bad thing, I would say it has to do with foundation waterproofing. And probably one of the most challenging systems is a basement. And I, I would say if you're doing a basement where it's at least partially or fully below grade, um, you really want to do your homework on this. And um, there's probably a dozen things you could do here. And if you do 10, 11 of them, you know, chances are you're probably going to be okay. But if you only do about half of them, you're really kind of rolling the dice. So most people that I see with foundations like this, they do a pretty good job of putting uh, gravel and then plastic underneath the slab. So you see that part right there. And they generally didn't tend to do a decent job with waterproofing the foundation wall itself, maybe a spray on or some sort of foundation. And they use often a drainage material like a mat with a filter on it. And the weak link tends to be the footing. And the footing right there at the bottom is able to essentially, it's, it's sitting there soaking wet and it wicks water up through the stem wall and out through the slab. And so here you did a great job on most of it, but this is the culprit right here. And so what we would suggest is that you either wrap the footing in plastic. Uh, that's one way to do that. Uh, and essentially tie that plastic into the plastic under the slab and tie it into the waterproofing on the stem wall uh, and, and make it a continuous, you know, watertight system. Um, that's one way to do it. I'll, I'll clear it here and say another way of doing it is to pour the footing and waterproof the top of the footing and then when you do your slab you tie your plastic to that and you do your your uh, um, foundation wall drainage uh, or waterproofing you tie that into it as well so that i think is a very important detail that boy once the house is built it's pretty hard to pick it up and fix that so you really want to get that right um, also other important details there's a, a drain tile you'll notice the the drain here is not on top of the footing. Uh, again, if it's next to the footing, that helps keep the footing dry. And that, of course, needs to, to route somewhere. It needs to, to flow downwards to, you know, to daylight or to a drain or to a sump pump at the very least. And then, of course, the grading on the 
the the foundation against the grating that slopes away the downspouts the gutters the 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 take the water away. You know, Joey, the rule, it's unwritten, but it's uh, the rule on gutters and downspouts is to try to take the water off of your roof and away from your foundation and dump it into your neighbors. Did you know that? That's, I think that's in the code somewhere. Yeah. 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 Not, not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good fences make good neighbors, but oh, fences the, don't really trap water. So that, oh, is that, is that how that works? Yeah. So um, the other thing is, um, one last detail is, anytime you transition from concrete to wood, I always recommend some form of a capillary break, uh, an anti-wicking break, um, because uh, we build out of so many porous materials, you know, um, uh, mortar and brick and concrete and wood and insulation products and chipboard and all this stuff can wick water. So um, that could be a, uh, peel and stick type membrane that could be a metal flashing that could be a, one of those pretty inexpensive sill gaskets that also helps to air seal all of this um, is just going to relieve that ability of water to wick through and and continue on, on up into the house so a nice detail here's some more pictures just if you're not familiar with the kind of the there's a bunch of products out there that often have dimples and some sort of filter cloth um, this was actually our south face building that we built in the mid 90s. We used an ICF foundation wall for the basement. Um, we waterproofed it. We did a drainage board that was kind of like a ductboard like product. So it's a drainable fiberglass board that drains down and it adds a little bit of insulation. Um, and then there's also the drain tile you can see that's going around and taking the water to the, to the drain. Um, here's an example of the footing wrapped in plastic, and here it looks like they're installing some drain tile. Um, other big thing is the the site. Um, you know, this picture on the left, it's just it's the way the site has been graded is anytime there's a hard rain, you're just loading up the foundation with moisture. So that that has some real, uh, you know, pretty much guaranteed problems with that, and it's going to result in a lot of ex extra air conditioning runtime to try to dry that and, and just very likely going to lead to some rot problems. This one is a real common um, ex thing I've experienced where <clears throat> they took the foundation, excuse me, they took the, the downspout and all the water off the roof, you know, they caught it in the gutter, they captured it, they ran it down here, and now they're dumping it into the foundation. The grade slopes into the house the foundation drain dumps into the house i don't know if you can joey can you tell on your screen that that's actually a little bit green the bricks yeah. are turning green yeah you, you can, can see, see that mm -hmm. so so not a not a good thing uh i thought i'd show some pictures this is the one of the houses that we worked on in january and we had um, a couple boy scout a half a dozen boy scouts in their troop leader and and um they were awesome man i just you know we i just said here do this i didn't get a good before picture but the grade sloped right into her foundation and the brick was really, you know, muddy and dirty. And so I had them uh, essentially dig a swale and uh, backfill against the home here. So we're really trying to divert the grade slopes this way and we're trying to divert it around the corner. So I think of a swale as a very shallow, um, it's not a ditch. So of course, you know, they kind of dug a trench and I said, well, I kind of need you to to ease it more and so it's a real it's a shallow um, more of an indentation and the idea is that we're getting the bulk of the rain from instead of going into the house we're just giving it a path to the back this house had a creek way back here and once we cleared the back of the house it all sloped beautifully down to the creek so it was great we just had to kind of get it there as opposed to into the foundation i think i have some more pictures that was um you know we put some some pine straw and it looked pretty good and again you can see where the, the creek is running and um, I think I have one that shows uh, yeah you can kind of see the site topography here it was really dumping into the foundation and now after their hard work it's actually diverted and uh, hopefully that will help keep that basement a lot drier she did have some issues with the wet basement the other thing you can do besides a swale of course is a um, French drain and there's all kinds of ways to do this but for me you dig a little trench usually you put a little a uh, little stone on the bottom then you put a in a perforated pipe and the perforations are on the bottom you kind of there's usually some filter cloth somewhere in the process and you wrap it with um, 
you know, gravel or stone or whatever. And then um, sometimes you leave the gravel exposed so you actually can see it. But other times you might put a filter cloth and then just grow grass on it. And it, it's basically like an in-ground gutter. So you're trying to, if you're on a slope, it's a way to, of course, divert the water around the foundation. And I know a lot of people understand this, but but you know this is stuff that's got to be corrected on homes. If if we're going to start weatherizing homes, we we have to address moisture as a part of that. So this is a this is a, a really important thing. I had to fix these kind of things on my own house before I could do a closed crawl space and and seal up my crawl space because I, I you know vents or no vents, uh, bad drainage on a crawl space, which a lot of houses have. You know, vents aren't going to fix that, and closing up is not going to fix that. So you you really got to remove the lion's share of the moisture load. Okay, we're going to shift over and talk about water vapor. And um, water vapor, uh, in this is an interesting photo. I I this was someone brought this to us. I did not take this photo, but I believe there was a fair amount of humidity in the attic. They were air conditioning their house, and you can see. Um, probably the house was under negative pressure because there was a leak in the attic access and it was pulling humid air in and, and essentially, you know, hitting on cold surfaces and eventually starting to grow stuff. Um, what caused the high humidity in the attic? I don't know. It could have just been, you know, living in the south. It could have been... Um, uh, I'm sure you, you may have run into this before, Joey, in your weatherization mm -hmm. travels where there, there's a vent, there's a bath fan, but there's no duct whatsoever. This one has sort of a duct, right? It, it's, <laughs> yeah, they tried. It, well, they forgot to put a sign that says, air, please keep going. This is what I call faith-based ventilation, where we hope and pray that the air knows it needs to go out the ridge. I don't know. So anyway, um, that's, that's, of course, an important reason why we must duct this fully to outside. Um, but, but in terms of how it moves, the water vapor can move by diffusion, which is You've got a high vapor pressure or a lot of water molecules on one side and a fairly dry or low vapor pressure on the other side. And an H2O literally just permeates across the material, um, as opposed to an air leak, which just carries uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, high humidity with it on the airstream. And if you put those two kind of in, in perspective, um, and I've seen a lot of ver variations on this, but if you take a four by eight sheet of unpainted drywall and you say, how much water vapor diffuses across that in a period of time? I've, I've heard it in a season, in a month. The answer is not that much, you know, maybe a third of a quart. That's unpainted. When you paint a, a drywall, you drop its permeability down dramatically. Um, as opposed to, Every, if everybody would that's listening, take your index finger and touch your thumb with it. And that's, you know, about a one square inch hole. And you're going to see basically a hundred times more moisture travels through an air leak through a hole that size. So I, I feel like, you know, in the big picture, and we used to have this wrong 20 something years ago, this was kind of uh, out of proportion. The, the codes were pushing us really hard on vapor retarders and people got confused with air sealing and air barriers. But ultimately today, I think we would all say air barriers are a hundred times more important than vapor retarders, or at least, you know, that's a general statement. We'll, we'll talk about climate zone factors in a second. Um, so the, the thing on vapor retarders, or barriers we used to use, I, I think of, when I see plastic, I think of the word vapor barrier. Um, the reality is, all materials have a permeability rating. And today I think the code kind of breaks them up in what they call class one, which is like plastic, very low permeability, I think one, less than one. And then sort of there's a class two, which is like a, you know, a, a, a paper face. I, I forget exactly, honestly, um, how they break it down. But and then class three, which is pretty vapor open materials like, you know, house wrap is an intentionally vapor open material. So, um, you know, just be aware of that. But the big takeaway is I think vapor retarders can get us into trouble when we put them in walls and ceilings. Um, if, if you're in a one-way climate, you could make a case for it. You know, it's always very cold outside and it's warm and relatively humid inside. 
But if you do that in the South, um, where you've got a, a mixed climate, you know, someone built a house that made sense in Canada, but they built it in North Carolina. And, you know, when you put plastic, you're basically trapping or you're stopping the ability of the moisture to, in this case, be able to dry through to the inside. And much of the year, the Southeast, it's drier and cooler inside and warmer and more humid outside. So arguably, if you had a vapor retarder, you'd rather it be on the outside of the wall, but then it would be wrong for the winter. So, you know, basically don't put plastic in your wall unless you're in a pretty darn cold climate. And so at least the codes today, they kind of say, unless you're in climate zone five and up, we're not even gonna talk about vapor retarders. So um, climate zone one through four, no need to do this. I thought I'd also share that I remember in the 90s going to a lot of, you know, hotels and motels in the Gulf Coast and they would, you'd walk in and they'd smell like mildew. And Joey, I don't know, can you see the splotchiness here on this image? Uh, yeah, we can see the vinyl, Yeah, behind the vinyl wall covering, which was basically acting just like this plastic. And we used to jokingly call it the Marriott measles and things like that. So a lot of hotels and motels have this. And, um, you know, it caused a lot of, of odors, it caused a lot of moisture issues and, and rot. And so to their credit, that industry figured out they, if they run it through a machine and poke a whole bunch of holes in it, they micro perfect. They, they kind of no longer trap moisture with it. So I think that's an interesting story. Okay, quick recap, Joey, I'm gonna ask you to answer these questions and maybe um, which of oh, these is not one of the four forms of bulk moisture. Um, we've got bulk, which is liquid water, uh capillarity which is what joey the um uh moisture wicking yeah sorry i we didn't practice this i, I apologize <laughs> air air leakage which is just carry an airstream carrying a bunch of humidity with it and uh, -huh. uh diffusion which is what water molecules you got it so the the answer that is not which it's still very important to Flux capacitance, it's, it's, a, it's a really critical term if you're trying to travel back in time, but it's not one of the four forms of moisture vapor. So. I think there's a lot more interest in, in time travel these days, so maybe we should look into yeah, that. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should do a webinar on, on time travel. That's a good one. All right. So um, what we want to do now is dive into the, to the dun 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 into psychrometrics. And um, this is one where we're we're not going to cover everything about it, but it's a pretty fascinating subject that once you really, there's a number of places on the internet where you can learn more about psychrometrics, but once you kind of grasp this, it takes you to the next level of understanding in terms of building science. And I had an actual quote from an architect who had been, to, I guess, to a couple of my trainings. He said, you know, Mike, you, you challenged me to learn more about this. And you know, I'm like, yeah, I probably did that. And, um, and he said, he said, well, I finally did. I read it and he goes, it really changed my life. And, and I said, wow, that's quite the statement, but I don't know if it will change your life, but it, he said, I really did have a better understanding of what was going on. So maybe I'll throw out the gauntlet on that. Um, uh, basically what is psychrometrics? It, it's a great word. I love the word. Um, it's the measurement of, of water vapor in it's understanding water vapor content in air and understanding the the impact of temperature on how much water vapor the air can hold i would say that's my definition of it and there's a couple of terms one is called absolute humidity which is not as i would say well heard of um it's it's basically how much actual water vapor is in the air and um sometimes you'll see it reported as pounds of uh, pounds of moisture per pound of dry air. I learned it using this term called grains, which is a grain is one seven thousandth of a pound of, of, of water. So it's a very tiny amount of moisture, but, um, but you know, it's a quantity. That's probably the big thing. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard the term relative humidity, but what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything unless I also tell you at a certain temperature. So understanding that air at any given temperature is capable of carrying a certain amount of water vapor how full is it relative to how much it could hold so that's my definition and then finally dew point which again a lot of people hear it what does it mean if the dew point of the air is 60 degrees that means any surface that's below 60 degrees 
that that air comes in contact, you're going to have what, Joey? Oh, this is my chance to let you stay Mountain Dew. You're gonna have you're gonna have condensation. Condensation. So, sorry, I was thanks. I was muted. I know, and I, I shouldn't do that to you, but sorry. Anyway, <laughs> so condensation. Um, and then I also thought I'd mention that uh, what relative humidity, uh, what is good for humans? And I thought I threw this on because of what's happening these days. Mm. And and I'm just gonna say a good target for us is 50%. 50% relative humidity is kind of the sweet spot. Um, and it doesn't mean anything unless I tell you the temperature. So at typical room temperatures, you know, it could range from the high 60s to let's say 80, low, low 80s, something like that. So I'm talking to, you know, somewhere in the, you know, in the low mid 70s is, is a pretty typical indoor room temperature. So if we can keep the relative humidity, you know, around 50%, we're, we're sort of we're going to win on all these issues. Obviously, if we get a hundred percent relative humidity, that means the air is saturated. We've got a whole lot of issues there, you know, rot and decay, of course, being one of them. Um, mold. Um, some mold can grow lower than this uh, in the in the sixty percent, but most of the mold that that we worry about, that stuff that really eats buildings and things like that, as long as we stay below seventy we're probably not going to have a big mold outgrowth. So that's kind of the magic trigger for mold. Um, a lot of people maybe have heard of these dust mites. They're a microscopic critter that eats, you know, dead skin cells. And then they they die and then they poop and what, you know, they poop and they die. And, and, it, and um, they are floating around in the air and they are an allergen. And, and um, I always notice in the wintertime, when it's a sunny day, the sun is a low sun angle and you see a shaft of sunlight shining in your window and you see little particles floating in it and you go, hey, that's that's a that's a dust mite head or leg or poop or whatever. So I hope you've learned something valuable today. That's probably it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, hey, kind of pertinent today. Um, uh, viruses uh, generally, you know, we, they they kind of thrive on air that that is too dry. So um, if you can keep your your relative humidity indoors, let's say you know above 40, your your virus uh, survival rate is uh, is greatly diminished. So you know that that could be relevant today. And of course, if it's really dry in your house, um, that a lot of times is related to in the winter time. Like uh, if your house is very leaky, a lot of cold air gets in and over dries your house and that has the, the effects as we can all relate to of you know chapped lips and dry sinuses and static electricity and that's obviously not comfortable so 50 percent really is a sweet spot uh and it's what we you know try to we can vary from that plus or minus you know probably 10 percent and it's not a big huge deal uh, i like to stay below 55 percent for dust mites and stuff and anyway that's a target that's where we'd like to hang this is a great analogy. Uh, that's why I want to emphasize this is just an analogy of how to understand relative humidity. And it involves the concept of air at different temperatures can kind of be represented by different vessels. And what you find that when air is cold, the vessel is pretty small. So here it's kind of like a, a highball glass or a you know, cocktail glass. And here, air at room temperature is sort of like a pint glass and air when it's hot at 90 degrees is is kind of like a you know 32 ounce growler here so we have different size vessels um, and you'll notice that if we put the same amount of water in each vessel the the small one here cold air you know it might be 90 percent full if we put a certain amount of moisture in it and if we had the same amount of moisture in the room temperature air, it's only 30% full. And the same amount of air in the hot air, excuse me, the same amount of moisture in the hot air, it's 15% uh, full. So ultimately, it's just a way of understanding relative humidity that warm air can hold more moisture than cold air. I don't know. Does that does that make you thirsty, Joey, after seeing this? That was my question. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's 11 o'clock, Mike. It's not 5 o'clock yet? Come on. All right. So... Um, dun, 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 the psychrometric chart. Okay. It's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of information on here. Try not to get overwhelmed. I think this is one of the best representations of it I've seen. There's lots of ways people can make this chart. 
Um, the information on the bottom is the dry bulb temperature. This is the actual measured air temperature you would get with a thermometer. The vertical scale over here is the absolute humidity. It's how many grains of water vapor. And generally, I'm just gonna say, humans tend to be happy if you're around 60 grains or so. Um, also, all these curves that you see, these are curves of constant relative humidity. You see there's a 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100% relative humidity where the air is saturated can't hold any more water vapor. It's going to condense out. And that also corresponds to um, where this vertical line hits is the dew point. Okay. Um, there are diagonal lines. We're not really going to talk about these. these. These correspond to wet bulb. And there's another term called enthalpy. That, that's for you to, to read up on afterwards. One of my old colleagues, um, shout out to Steve Hertzley. He, he, he's the one that told me about this. He likes to use the rule of thumb and it's just a way to think about it. As the you, you take your thumbs and you point them in opposite direction. You say as the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down. Or if the temperature goes down, the relative humidity goes up. It's just a way to kind of reinforce that concept. So we're going to take an example. I'm going to find a 75 degrees on the bottom here and I'm going to go up to the 50% relative humidity uh, curve right there where it intersects. And I'm going to put a dot and then I'm going to draw a horizontal line through that. And if you read all the way over to the right, you can see that it has about 63 grains. So I'm going to let that fill in. And then if you read all the way over to the left, you'll see that it intersects the 100% curve at about 55 degrees. And so that would be the dew point. And one key takeaway here is that you, if I, if you know the air has 63 grains, it's the same as knowing that the air has a 55 degree dew point. You don't, you still don't know where you are on the chart yet, unless I tell you a temperature or some other information. It takes, you kind of have to know two things to know exactly where you are on the chart. But if you say, if you say 55 degree dew point, that means you're somewhere on this horizontal line and that, that you have about 63 grains. Okay. So we got that example. Now let's try one of these little thumb examples where we're gonna heat the air. So we're starting here, we're gonna heat the air. And when we heat the air, we're moving horizontally to the right where it says, let's heat it to 90 degrees. What happens to the relative humidity? Well, the temperature went up, so the relative humidity goes down. And likewise, um, we would say we started at 50% RH, we heated it to 90, and now we're at about, I think I'd call that about 30. So we're about 30% relative humidity. So let's go the other direction. Let's cool it. Let's cool it down um, from 90 all the way down to 60. The temperature went down, so the relative humidity went up. And I would say it's probably somewhere in the mid 80s. Um, so again, kind of reinforcing some concepts here. So that's a room temperature example. Let's try a winter example. One time I was teaching a class and I remember it was cold. That was winter time and it had just finished raining. It was 40 degrees out. It had just finished raining. And I told the, the class, I said, I know it's hard to believe it just finished raining. You can see outside. Um, if a cubic foot of that air leaked into our building right now, it would dry out the building. And everybody was kind of like, what? I don't believe you. You're a liar. And I was like, well, let me see if I can prove it to you. So I said, let's assume that the air had just finished raining. It's, you know, somewhere in the 90% relative humidity, but it's um, 40 degrees. So let's go down here and find that spot. And I'll put a, a, a dot and then we'll draw our horizontal line. And that can tell us that how many grains, it looks like about 30. And you can see that from the right side. And it looks like you don't have to go very far before you hit the left side. And dew point's probably 37 and a half, 38, something like that. Um, and so what's interesting is now I said, okay, that cubic foot of air leaks into your house and now the furnace or the heat pump has to warm it back up to room temperature. So let's heat it up to room temperature. And now we're up at 70 degrees and the relative humidity of course went down. And I would say the new relative humidity is, I don't know, 28%. And so it actually is drying out the house, even though it just finished raining. 
that's that's a crazy that's one of those things where i have to i usually have to smell a permanent marker and kind of think about it but i don't know do you ever do that joey i don't i'm, I don't try, like that. I'm trying to quit that's good that's probably good anyway so um an interesting concept and of course if you cooled it down to 38 you'd be uh, increasing the humidity you're probably right at just about at saturation so the next example i want to talk about is a summer example and i want to I want to start on a day where it's not that hot, but it's really muggy. So we're going to find 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's temperature wise, not all that hot, but it's 80% relative humidity. I'm going to put a dot right there and I'm going to read over and I'm like, wow, that is a whole lot of grains of moisture. I'm, I'm guessing it's around 123. And likewise, if I go to the left, it looks like my dew point is probably around 73 degrees. Uh, so an 80-80 day is going to have a 73 degree dew point or a whole lot of grains, 123 grains of moisture. And, you know, this is a little bit of hand waving, but let's pretend that that's how it is in the morning. Then the sun comes out and it just blasts everything and the air heats up to 95 degrees. So of course we're gonna travel that way. And um, naturally the temperature goes up, so the RH goes down. And so instead of 80% humidity, now we're at 50% relative humidity. But we still have the same amount of grains and the same amount of dew points. So that's one consideration is that, you know, when it's 95 degrees out and 50% relative humidity, it's the same amount of moisture as when it's 80-80. And also think about it, we have many, many more hours of the summer, at least here in Atlanta, where we have these conditions than when we have these conditions. Frankly, the hot days are not really the problem because the hot day, the thermostat says, run that air conditioner. And so we're getting cooling, but we're also getting a lot of runtime, which means drying. The challenging days of which we have many, many more hours of days or, or hours, I guess I should say like this, is the 80-80 conditions where it's not that hot but it's all muggy and it's the same dew point so i think that's that's a really good takeaway from a, from a humid climate so if we cool that air now down to 75 degrees you know we're definitely increasing the rh it's probably pushing 95 percent relative humidity we don't have to go very far we're two degrees colder uh we're at we're at dew point and you know when you think about it if the air is like that it has a 73 degree dew point Joey, have you ever encountered a home where someone set their thermostat at 70 in the summer? Occasionally, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, people who really want it super cold and try not to be too judgmental here, but you're actually creating surfaces that are, you know, below the dew point of the outdoor air, which is a little bit on the edge. So something to think about. Um, so having said that, I've got some quizzes, Joey. We're gonna go fast through these. You're Rap gonna have rapid to- fire. You're going to rapid fire. So here we go. Cold air is very what? Dry. Dry air. You got it. Which can hold more moisture, warm air or cold air? Warm. Yeah, warm is the bigger vessel. If a cubic foot of air gets heated, what happens to the relative humidity? Thumbs down. Thumbs down. If a cubic foot of air is cool, what happens to relative humidity? Thumbs up. Yeah. It, without changing the moisture content, heating air will cause RH to... Thumbs down. Yeah, I was gonna say it was a trick question. Um, <laughs> let's say you've got uh, a certain amount of air, we'll say 75 degrees, and you're not gonna change the air temperature at all, but you're gonna mist, you're gonna use a room humidifier. You're gonna mist humidity into that room. What will that happen? What will happen to the You're adding grain, so it's gonna increase. Exactly. And let's take the opposite where we go into a closet and it's got a high moisture load in it and we put a desiccant in it, you know, one of those silica gel packets that says yeah. do not eat you know damp they're delicious rid. by all means yeah yeah damp rid, yeah but by all uh, means go home and eat one of those it's, it's gonna obviously be thumbs down yeah. yeah yeah all right so here's another one joey if a cubic foot of air held exactly half the water vapor that it theoretically could hold what's the rh half 50 percent yep or if it held a third of the water vapor it theoretically could hold what's the rh 33.3 .3. Yeah, 
And here's an interesting question. Your, your body in the summertime cools you via sweat evaporation. Therefore, humid air generally feels, feels blank comfortable in the summer. Less. We would, we would accept less or un, we would accept uncomfortable <laughs> as well. Um, here's another one. Air that is too blank in the winter is uncomfortable and can lead to chap lips and static electricity and nosebleeds. What's that? Dry. Dry or cold because cold air is drier. Um, mold generally starts to grow where? Oh, somewhere around 70%, I believe. Yeah, we're going to go with 70 and, and acknowledge some molds can grow before that. Um, and here's an interesting one that you can actually solve without the chart or with the chart. If you just think about it, you can say, it. so you got air and it's at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and it's 40% full. So I'm going to go up here, 80 and 40%, and I put a dot and it says I've got 60 grains in it. And it says we're going to increase the amount of moisture from 60 to 120 what would the new relative humidity be? Uh, double the grains, so double the relative humidity to 80. You got it, very good. You passed, congratulations. Yes. And uh, I know we went through that fast, but hopefully that was um, of some value to people. And checking my time here, got it looking good. I've got um, one last thing is there's a cool website if you wanna play with this, just to kind of get a feel for this dew point calculator tool. It's a little slider. You can and I slid the temperature up to 80 and the RH up to 80 and it says, here's the dew point. You can, and it also tells you uh, you're at risk of growing stuff. So that's kind of a neat little tool to play with. The last thing I want to talk about is one of my favorite topics, which is drainage planes. I'm going to have to go fast, but why does this really good cladding, why does brick veneer work so well when brick is porous and mortar is porous and it rains and the wind blows and the brick gets soaking wet, then the sun comes out and it dries the outer eighth of an inch to the outside, but most of that moisture is shoved to the back of the wall. How come the wall doesn't rot down? Two things. There's some sort of a water shedding surface and an air gap. And the water shedding surface in this example is felt and the air space is, you know, the gap behind the brick and that's the forgiveness. So we can do that. And of course, there's also some very important things which we put in these little openings right here um, and those are called weep holes. And Joey, should you caulk those up for energy efficiency? Um, uh, unfortunately, no, we're gonna have to leave them. Yeah, we wanna leave those holes. Those are, those are good holes. Um, I've seen it done, so don't do that. Um, and I wanted to show that you can do this on just about any cladding. So this is a building I built about uh, 20, oh, 18 years ago or something. And I used a very inexpensive siding uh, it was donated and it's masonite and it's a wood fiber siding that had a lot of failures with it um, and so i back primed it and every time i cut the edge i edge primed it just because end grain is really absorptive but i i put furring strips over the the house wrap and that created a vented cavity behind it which really helped with the durability that's kind of what it looked like um, and what's interesting is that building looks like i painted it yesterday uh, I, I, I've talked to other builders that have done this, and the main thing that you get out of this is paint life. So even though, yeah, fiber cement siding is pretty hard to kill, I would still do this because of durability and moisture forgiveness. There's a lot of products that and ways to get there. This is like a almost like a little Brillo pad that is a spacer piece. It's called Home Slicker. Here they're using felt as the water barrier, the water shedding barrier. But they're, and they're using some other kind of cladding on it. There's some great systems out there. If you're gonna use house wrap, getting the details right is really critical. And this is one where I gotta admit, in my early days of construction, I just did what they told me. I kind of did it wrong. We'd wrap over the um, rough opening and we'd take a utility knife and we'd cut an X in the house wrap and then you'd peel these four triangles to the inside, the left, the right, and the bottom. Those are okay, the top was wrong because then we put a flanged window over it like these people did and you get some wind driven rain. Just imagine a drop of water hits the house wrap. It needs to flow down and essentially be shingled away. It tucked in behind the flange and rotted out the heading. This house was not even a year old or it was, was only a year old. Um, so how do you do it correctly? Um, we wanna cut an upside down Y and the left uh, peel the left end, the right end, the bottom end cut some slits and fold the top up 
set your window and then go over the top of the window. Um, sort of like in this picture, don't be, this is some uh, J molding for the vinyl, but you can see that they flashed it correctly. Um, so that's a good segue into integrating your windows and your other types of flashing properly. What's wrong with this picture? That flashing should be behind the house wrap. They should take a knife and cut the house wrap and tuck the flashing up uh, behind it. And here's another example of a, of a sort of moisture problem built in. That that siding should not be run all the way. That there should be flashing that that you should be able to see for a couple inches. And also no kickout flashing to divert the water away. That's going to be a, a failure. Um, here's some pictures. I this is one a building in my own neighborhood. I saw them it had siding nailed to the studs, and uh, it looks like masonite siding. It had some moisture problems. Water can wick between lap siding. Um, and also air can move through it. And um, I like products, I like these kind of products that have the weather barrier already attached to the sheathing and a really good tape that if it's applied right works well. There's also fluid applied weather barriers. Here you see some, uh, it's got an interesting look to it, but it's all gonna get covered up and it's gonna perform very well. Um, and I, my last thing is I wanted to show a little case study. I don't have any good before pictures. I need to do a better job of that, but. I had a wooden board that probably was a doorway and then some siding. This is what my house looked like when I bought it. And I just had some of these, I was putting on some solar panel, uh, solar or hot water a long time ago. This is what it looked like. So I started tearing into it and um, I removed the siding at the top. And I wanted to point out that one thing that my wife and I did before we bought our house is we blew cellulose dents packed in the walls. And for the most part, it didn't fall out. I had a, a couple little spots where I learned how to, you know, do this. So I just put felt over it just as a net, basically, to keep it from falling out. So I, I, I wanted to point that out. The, the felt is not there for any moisture reasons, although it doesn't hurt. Um, and, uh, and I patched the places that needed to be in and covered it all with the felt. And then when I tore into where this door thing is here, this is where it was like, wow, that's really ugly. I pulled that off and, and they had just I don't know. It was hideous. And then I pulled the insulation up and I was like, oh, I can see into my crawl space. So that's not a good thing. My wall's venting into my crawl space. So I air sealed it and I insulated it. And now it's time for sheathing. And the sheathing that I used is a hybrid sheathing that um, basically it's, it goes by the name of structural insulated sheathing. So it's a structural panel that is only about an eighth of an inch thick. And then it's got foam board attached to it. And I think it was a, a half inch total. So I just didn't have a lot of depth to play with. So this was a good product for my application. You have to put a lot of fasteners in it, um, about double what you would do with say wood sheathing. And um, then you have to countersink all the fasteners because you really want the nail head to grab the energy brace or the thermoply part right here. Um, so it, it, it didn't seem like it was gonna be that hard to do. It's only a couple of sheets, but my arm fell off, so it was, <laughs> it was hard. Um, this is uh, cocked a couple places, but basically I taped the joints. Uh, I sealed the seams, and now the skin of this um, product is basically my weather barrier. So that's what it looked like. And then I wanted to do the um, furring strips, but here's a nice detail. Uh, I took a three inch strip of insect screen, and I needed something to hold it. So I just ran a little bead of caulk to squish it into. And you can see it hangs down about an inch and a half lower than the sheathing. And then when I put my furring strips on it, and I ripped furring strips as thin as I could get. I just took a pressure treated two by and I ripped it on my table saw and it was more than an eighth of an inch, but less than a quarter of an inch. So I'm calling it three sixteenths. Um, it really, any gap is good. Um, and it doesn't have to be three quarters of an inch, although some builders just use a one by, um, which is fine. Uh, so anyway, I, I did that and then I folded the, um, the screen up and stapled it into the bottom of the furring strip. And um, that created essentially a vented cavity that critters can't get up in there and nest. So I think that's a nice detail. Uh, so there it is, it's pressure treated. I went, you know, because I'm me, I went ahead and just dipped the ends in a, in a primer bucket just to get a little really make the bottoms last but it's pressure treated so it should hold up pretty well and then um, I used fiber cement and I hadn't done it I hadn't used fiber cement in a while 
Um, I caught the ends, but I did a butt joint. It's called a floating butt joint. And if you just put a piece of either metal or felt or some kind of flashing behind it, that's a nice detail as well. Even if you don't do the furring strips, I would definitely do that, that sheet metal. But anyway, that's what it looked like. And um, there you can see the gap. And here you can see it's going on. I'm checking my time here and we're almost done. I'm loading up here and, uh, and then, you know, doing the trim around the windows. And here's a good, it kind of shows a section of it, a cutaway here where the the kitchen hood was uh, and that's what it looked like in the winter and that's what it looked like in the summer and um, what's cool is a year later we uh, had the rest of the house painted and so this has been painted more recently than this photo that was painted a year prior so everybody check back in with me in 10 years and i'll let you know how it's looking but i'm quite confident this is going to need to be painted a lot sooner than this will and so I'm gonna skip this. This is just a way of doing it on the inside. There's also a great product that uh, um, the Zip system has this with our value already attached. My friend Carl built a house like this and he used the home slicker product to fur out the, the uh, fiber cement. I mean, that is just a really solid, you know, I think he did a two by six construction with this foam board and the weather barrier. I mean, that's just a really high performance wall. I like that assembly. And so, Joey, this is it. I'm going to give you some questions, and then we're going to open up the polls here. A homeowner notes their house is on a hillside and digs a shallow swale to divert flow around the foundation. What would that be an example of? Uh, bulk moisture. Love it. After taking a shower, a homeowner runs the exhaust fan for 30 minutes to remove the moisture. That would be an example of? Uh, humidity. Yeah, the air movement. Um, uh, a homeowner notes that the bottom six inches of the drywall in their garage has some mold growing on it. And they had a plumbing line that flooded their garage last month and they cleaned it up pretty quickly. What caused that to happen? Um, is that capillarity? That would be that wicking effect. And then finally, a homeowner notes that their plastic in their crawl space, I see water underneath the plastic. And, and what, what's that water coming from? Uh, is that the diffusion? Yep, that's water diffusing up. And the, and the vapor retarder is doing its job. It's keeping that water in the ground. So, whew, man, that was a lot of content. Sorry if we ran a minute or two long, but we more or less finished. You want to open up the poll for this question? Yeah, we got a quick poll, and then uh, we'll, we'll handle some questions. So uh, which zone – oh, excuse me. That's the wrong one. Let me do this real quick. <laughs> Uh, so what, uh, if anything, will you be doing uh, after this webinar? Uh, so are you going to be cleaning those gutters? Yeah, I got to do that. Looking at your site for, yeah, I felt like these were mostly just reminders for yourself. That's, that's um, it, yeah. <laughs> look at your site for potential drainage issues, um, or you're going to grab an umbrella and, and go out there in the rain. And I do thought the you get extra points for that, really. You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, check your AC condensate line. Is that a, is that another reminder for you, Mike? Always a good thing to check periodically. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, everyone, of course, is looking for that uh, Boy Scout troop. So yeah, it looks like um, yeah. Uh, I think I think hopefully it looks like about half uh, are going to take a look at some uh, potential drainage issues. So I think hopefully we had an impact. Uh, hopefully we gave you a good. Um, a good project to take on here if you've uh, got a little bit of uh, free time on your hands. So it's back to you now. All right. As always, thank you so much for hanging with us. And uh, we we certainly crammed a lot in. I'm excited that we've knocked out the first three topics and, you know, they're all kind of foundational knowledge. And now we can really get into some more nitty gritty on some installations, having sort of laid the groundwork. And the next one is going to be next Tuesday. And then we're kind of going to skip to the following week. And then I think, Joey, we're going to, you know, after next Tuesday, we're going to start um, really running on an every Thursday schedule. So the, the, the next one will be April 30th, and we're going to do it on ventilation and kind of really seeing the, the concepts of ventilation and how do I figure out how much ventilation I need. And then uh, maybe the following one, I, I'm going to try to make that be the second part of ventilation, which is how do I do this? You know, what are some good ways to provide fresh air and, and what are some, you know, pros and cons? So um, again, thank you so much to everybody. Um, we made it to the finish line. If you want to stick around and, and join our chat uh, or, or, you know, usually we do 15 or so minutes of questions. I'm 
hang in there. Joey, what do we have? Anything? Um, so first things first, uh, I did uh, forget to put the handouts on on the actual GoToMeeting um, interface. So Ali is going to be sending those out uh, probably later, later today or possibly tomorrow. So you'll get uh, the handouts and you'll also get a webinar recording uh, of this. So um, I did have a couple of stories. Uh, I think we asked oh, that good. pretty early on. Um, so, uh, naturally a few people had, um, issues with water in their crawl space, you know, that un underground swimming pool, uh, scenario that we see a lot in, in I human. I should have put that picture in. Yeah. 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 Um, someone yep. was having, uh, potential, uh, humidity issues in the attic as well, um, which mm. we see, you know, uh, quite a bit. It's getting a huge gain in the summer, uh, and then also from the winter as well. So, uh, we do, we do see that. Um, let's see, handouts, blah, 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 uh, craft paper. You want to talk a little bit more about those vapor diffusion retarders? Do we need those in a mixed humid zone? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I would say if you, and this is my opinion, if you are doing bat insulation install, which is, um, coincidentally the topic we're going to be talking about on, uh, or part of our topic on next Tuesday, uh, I, I, my personal preference um, on insulation is I like sprayed insulation because you and you can spray foam, cellulose, or fiberglass. I like sprayed insulation because I think the coverage is better. But if you're using bats, I would prefer unfaced bats. Um, mm -hmm. And they're there. You can get a vapor retard. You can get vapor retarder paint if you really feel like you need a vapor retarder uh, in your. But if you're in climate zone four or three or two or one you don't need to worry about it. Just use unfaced insulation. The reason I like unfaced better is because I, I think people tend to screw up the paper faced uh, install more so. We'll talk more about that on the next uh, webinar, but that's a great question. Like I said, in, in my opinion, uh, I would use unfaced insulation and um, I just think you get a neater fit and that's what, you know, really neatness counts on, on, uh, on fiberglass bats. Um, and also the permeability of plastic is, you know, it's probably below 0 0.1, it's point, I think six mil poly is like 0 0.06 permeability. Mm -hmm. And paper facing is probably like half a perm. So, right. you know, it's almost an order of magnitude <laughs> different. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of you know, and it, it, you know, order of magnitude means we move the decimal point and, um, and so do you need it in climate zones one through four? No, the paper facing, I would almost even say zone five, a lot of zone five probably doesn't really need plastic. So I, again, plastic, because it's so unforgiving, I would tend to lean towards, um, you know, a, a lesser, a less stringent vapor retarder if you feel like you need a vapor retarder. There are products too out there. Um, one I know is called Membrane that are actually kind of like smart vapor retarders that if they get wet or they actually open up and become more permeable. Um, so, you know, if you really want to go that route, if it makes you feel good, go for it. That's a, a better choice to me than plastic. But if you're in climate zones one through four, I would say, you know, use unfaced and don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, we had a question uh, on the weatherization. Um, I'll take this one about uh, the vapor barrier under a, a, a crawl space. Uh, it does generally That's a need. Good barrier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it does generally need to cover the piers. I mean, I, you didn't say what state you are, just that it was mixed humid and hot and humid. So yeah. uh, best practice is to cover those piers uh, with a poly, and then you know put that in in there with a ram set gun if you're working with um concrete blocks or you know you can nail it up if the um beams are are wooden in some crazy uh region. yeah that's no that's a good point joey and i was going to add that um on my own crawl space we kind of did a detail where we we skirted the piers with some plastic and ended up kind of using like a combination of mastic and mm -hmm. tape yeah and didn't use any mechanical fasteners, but the combination of the mastic and the tape on the skirting around it um, seemed to do the job, and it seems like it's holding quite well. Yeah. And then, of course, the that laid down onto the ground, and then the ground plastic tied into that plastic of the skirt. And we'll yeah. talk more about that. 
Yeah, the tape is actually, that's an interesting point. Uh, our friends at Community Housing Partners that we do a lot of our weatherization training with, they they turned me on to the, uh, using actually that zip tape um, yeah. that, that we've, yeah. we've shown that zip system for a while. You can just buy that um, zip tape and it's extremely strong. You know, it's it's like kind of comically strong. You would expect it to see it in like a, uh, as seen on TV commercial, but it'll like, it'll hold oh, up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. did the guy impressive. make a rowboat with a screen door in it or something? Yeah, I forget what Flexi. Something, something you know. like that. Yeah. Flexi. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, on the uh, French drains, uh, how far away from the home would you want that to be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not going to. Oh, by the way, this is a great piece of trivia that the French drain is not named after um, the French nation. I just thought people might know it's, it's named after a guy named French Henry Price. French. Oh. Yeah, no, Henry French, oh, uh, Henry Flag French, I think is his name. He's the guy who came up with that. Um, uh, you know, I kind of uh, would say I, I wouldn't want to get much closer than the where, if you can if you're assuming your house has an overhang. You know, let's say the overhang projects out a foot and a half. I wouldn't want to get the French drain. Uh, much closer to the house than that. Now, mm -hmm. I am not claiming to be, uh, I'm not a civil engineer, a hydrology expert, but that's that was my take on it, is I like the grade from the house to slope downwards away from the house to the French drain. Um, and let's say, you know, a, a minimum of foot and a half, something like that. And, and I think sometimes you got to do with, you got to make the best with the situation you've got. So, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule. And if anybody has other suggestions along those lines, I'm, I'm open to it. I, I've even seen houses that were really, in Atlanta, we have a lot of houses that are built on a, a, a slope and they a lot of times will have a, a walkout basement foundation. And, you know, you've got, I, you, you really got to divert the water around the house on the sides. And a French drain is a great way to do it. I've seen people install more than one. Um, where it's kind of like the first line of defense and the second line of defense, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of help deal with bulk moisture. Um, someone's asking about measuring moisture, um, particularly for a low income uh, weatherization type program. And I'll just answer that one too. I just yeah. I just looked it up right now. I mean, the the most the cheapest way to do it would just to use an old fashioned sling psychrometer, and <laughs> they they even have digital ones now that are running less than than a hundred dollars. And I'm I'm looking right now. I'm not gonna uh, buzz market the the name of the website or anything, but it looks like you can get a, a decent one for you know a couple hundred dollars. And I would absolutely try to do that uh, because it's, it's helpful them. to know that. I've seen them cheaper than that, Joey. I've, I, I, we did. Um, there's a historic building called the Wren's Nest uh, in in uh, West Atlanta, West West End. That um, uh, the guy who wrote Burr Rabbit's home, and um, it, it we did a retrofit on a crawl space there, and we found a moisture sensor that was on a probe, and the probe was maybe 18 inches long, and we just mounted the little control panel, panel kind of in a baseboard in, in the office of someone's office in the building and it it would measure um, the relative humidity in the crawl space and in the house and other I think it had like three measurements and yeah. the, the thing was probably less than 75 bucks I think it was yeah. you know so that was a couple of years ago but yeah I think there are choices out there Definitely. Um, question about it on uh, humid and warm days when the air conditioner does not run much, what's the most effective way to drop relative humidity? And this might be a question for our ventilation. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess um, ultimately, you know, uh, I would always say don't try to fix a drainage problem with a dehumidifier. Yeah. But if that's your temporary Band-Aid and you got to do it, you got to do it. In other words, you know, that's not your long-term solution. But, um, you know, we do not. There are definitely some health issues that and, and some, you know, mold growth explosion and stuff that if we don't manage moisture in our home, we could really be getting into trouble. So if you have to run a dehumidifier uh, to deal with that, I'm going to say run a dehumidifier. You're going to pay for the energy that's mm -hmm. not free. Um, you know, my, my goal would be, okay, I'm doing that as a temporary measure. 
and I'm going to try to fix the moisture problem. Why do I have high relative humidity? Is it because of a lot of infiltration and I live in a humid climate? Okay, I'll air seal. Is it because of bad drainage on the foundation? Okay, I'll do French drains and grading and things like that. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, you want to control that source or else you're just going to be uh, spending a lot of money to dehumidify air that's just going to keep on getting wet and yeah. wet. It, it's a band-aid and I'm not saying it isn't a good band-aid in that situation, but you know, that's, it's not really curing the problem. So, yeah. And I think kind of the inverse of that, we had a question. I think there may have been a little bit of confusion here, but, um, and, and I don't believe you said this, but the question is how does water vapor from the crawl space cause your AC to run longer? And I, I don't think we said that. Oh. And, and I don't think well, we applied uh, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, in my own example, I would say it's it's very humid in the crawl space, um, mm -hmm. especially without plastic. And yeah. um, but that wouldn't that affect humidity, the air conditioner at all, would it? Oh, it could absolutely. Um, quite frankly, because there's very commonly going to be leak paths between the crawl space and the house. Um, you know, ask my nose how I know that to be true <laughs> in all half a dozen vented crawl space houses I've lived in. Not to mention. A lot of times when you have a crawl space, you have a duct system down there and the ducts have leakage. And so we're, you know, we touched on that very briefly the other day on air leakage, but um, absolutely the crawl air gets connected to the house air and, and, and it also it can diffuse as well. So if you've got a high amount of moisture content below the house and it's relatively drier inside, the moisture will diffuse. And that's a weaker effect. I would say it's generally more because of air leakage. I got you. Well, that's about 15 minutes, and I think the questions are kind of slowing down, so that sounds like a good opportunity to shut this thing down. So once again, the reminders uh, are on the screen about when we're going to be uh, doing this. We'll be back next Tuesday, April 21st. Um, and Mike, I'll let you, uh, if you have any other closing thoughts or... No, I want to play some more music, but I really thank you. We we had a 30 people still with us through the very end of, of the doctor patient session that we just did right there. That was a lot of fun. Uh, no, but, and thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Please give us your comments and your feedback and um, hopefully you'll, you'll keep spreading the word and keep joining us. I've been thrilled with the attendance on each of these. So again, everybody have a great day, stay safe and uh, we'll hopefully see you again next uh, Tuesday. All right.